really it's been a pretty great year here at Elevation Church. I don't mean that we haven't had struggles. I don't mean that we haven't had challenges and you know you've had yours and I've had mine. We'll talk about it sometime. But today we came to appreciate that God brought us full circle. That he brought us through. If I could pick any weekend for a first-time guest to come to church, this would be the weekend. It wouldn't be Easter. It wouldn't be Christmas. I would pick this one because I guess people can sing just about anything they want to sing. Sometimes you sing along with songs on the radio. You don't even know the lyrics or haven't thought about them. You know. So I reckon when we sing about our love for God, that's one thing, and that, that is great. It's great. It's great. And I think we can highlight our Bibles and all of that. But this weekend, you will see John 3.16 in action. God so loved the world, he gave his son. And when you really love something, you give. And in just a few moments, I, I am going to preach a little bit, with or without your permission. I am going to preach a little bit today. I have this bad habit when I preach. I'll, I'll, I'll be preaching. I'll say, can I preach a little bit? And uh, I'm not really asking. Okay? It's a rhetorical question. But I am just going to preach a little bit today. It will be a little bit shorter because we, we've set aside time to bring our year-end beyond offering. The offering on a practical level… Did you notice that? That blows my mind that instead of crossing their arms when I talked about giving, people started clapping their hands, excited to do it, excited, delighted to do it. I love it. I love it. God loves a cheerful giver. With big smiles, we're going to bring an offering to God today. I've been praying for someone who would give a million dollars. I have. I've been praying that someone would give a million dollars today. I've been praying that someone would give a uh, hundred dollars. Uh, maybe the hundred dollars in God's eyes might be a bigger sacrifice for that person than the million dollars. We're not looking for equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. And I kind of want to come around that word sacrifice today. I won't leave you standing uh, for, for the whole devotional thought I want to share today, but I do want you to share for stand for the scripture that I want to share. The Lord was reminding me of Mark chapter 14 as a picture of sacrificial giving. In Mark chapter 14, we read about one woman's sacrificial gift in the context of a larger gift that we're still experiencing today. And uh, Real briefly, I want to share these verses. Mark chapter 14, verse 1. Now, the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him, but not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Okay, I just read that to give you the setting. Here's the story. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, that's a rough nickname. They wouldn't have been in his house if he still had leprosy, but he was still known by what he used to have. I wonder, was he one of the ones that Jesus healed? Maybe so. And maybe out of gratitude for the gift of healing that he had received, he wanted to host Jesus in his own home. Anyway, just a thought. Just a thought that when God has done something for you, when God has, has been good to you in a tangible, specific way, something inside of you ought to want to make room for God to use you, to see what he can do through you, not just for you, but through you. And all this is going on, and a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard, and she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Now, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste? Okay, literally in the language of the Bible, Pastor Jerry, to what end this waste? The literal translation, to what end this waste? Okay, just hold that thought. Why this waste? To what end this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. 
Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. See, when I give, when I praise, I'm not doing it for you. In fact, even when I give, I'm not giving it to the church. I'm giving it through the church to God. She did a beautiful thing to me. Mind your own business. She did a beautiful thing to me. Besides, the poor you will always have with you, but this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. And truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, even in 2016 at Elevation Church, what she has done will also be told. In memory of her. We're, we're still talking about that woman. The scent of her sacrifice is still in the air today because she gave it. So I want to spend a few moments talking about making sense of sacrifice. Making sense of sacrifice. Father, bless your word, bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Funny how we immediately take the woman's side when that scripture is read. You know, we, we, we immediately want to tell the disciples who didn't understand what was going on in this story how, how, how wrong they were. And, uh, you know, I actually identify with the disciples more than I would like to admit, these people in Jesus' inner circle who should have probably rejoiced at this woman's sacrifice. You didn't get it in Mark's gospel, but it's recorded in three different gospels. Matthew, Mark, and John record this incident. This one woman, she makes the pages of the eternal word of God. And Although Mark doesn't specify, we're told in the other gospel accounts that the perfume was so expensive that she poured on Jesus, it was equivalent to a year's wages. So this isn't something you put in a stocking. This is not cool water. I just took it back to 1997, and y'all didn't even know it. But it was pure nard from the Himalayan mountains, and it was a root fragrance. It filled the air, and I was taught by one of my Bible teachers to read the Bible with all of your senses. Try to get in the scene and feel what different characters would have felt and smell what they would have smelled. So I smelled the food that they had just finished eating. And um, over top of the fried chicken, here comes this, this root perfume. What's happening? Here's this crazy woman who busted up on this party and just started pouring. Wait a minute. Is that pure nard she's pouring? That's pure nard she's pouring. And immediately I'm trying to calculate because my mind always wants to make sense. How many know that every time your heart tries to have faith, your mind will try to make sense? And the two will often be in contradiction because here are some people saying this doesn't make sense. You know, when you give to God on a sacrificial level, if it's really a sacrifice, you will hear a voice telling you, this doesn't make sense. If you really give God a good gift, you will throw up a little bit in your mouth. You will at least, at the very least, feel a little bit queasy about it. You will second guess it. I mean, I'm telling you, I, when, I, when I dropped my gift the first time I gave a gift, I remember how many zeros I put on it. Never thought I would give a gift that big in my life. You know, it was easy for me to give to God, by the way, when I didn't have much because what did I have to lose? Here's a Hail Mary. You know, if you're down 56 to nothing, what does it hurt? But when you have a little something and God calls you to give a little something, you know, this is a year's wages for this. This woman. Do the math. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense, does it? I remember one time telling one of my youth group leaders who had just had a baby. I said, 
And I was only a teenager at the time, so forgive me for what I'm about to say that I said. I would not say it now, but I said it then. It was where I was at the time. I said, I don't know why anybody would ever want to bring one of those into the world. Because, shut up. I hate when y'all do that to me. <laughs> You're supposed to be a pastor. Jesus said, let the little children come unto me, but I'm not Jesus. All right? So I was like, I was like, they, they spit on you, they, they yell at you. I just don't get it. And, and my youth group leader, uh, the man said back, he goes, uh, he said this little line that parents say, and you don't get it until you're a parent. It's different when they're yours, making sense of sacrifice. I guess a lot of the things we do in church wouldn't make sense to someone who was just coming in as a spectator. Why do they lift their hands? Does someone have a gun, Regina? <laughs> Regina? <laughs> what are they reaching for? But then maybe you come to a point in your life where you go through something, and the weight of the world is on your shoulders, and you want to get it off, and you say, Hey, God, you're real big, and I'm real small, and I surrender all to you because I can't do it on my own. I need you, Father. And all of a sudden, it'll make sense. Surrender makes sense. Surrender only makes sense when you've been through enough and uh, may not make sense to people why you even come to church. You know, on your day off, you go out there to that church and watch that preacher on the screen. <laughs> On the screen, on the TV screen. <laughs> yeah, but it's HD. But still, really? Yeah, because God speaks to me there. I, I'm not real worried about whether or not the man is in the room. I just want to hear the word of God because the word of God can come to my house. Jesus didn't even have to show up at the centurion's house. He just spoke a word, and the word. Carried weight. And so it's gonna be a good day. It's gonna be a good day. We're about to sacrifice to God. About to sacrifice to God. And I know to some it makes no sense. I know that even in my own life, sometimes it's hard to have faith and make sense. And I know these disciples, they um, they were having a hard time making sense. Of this woman's extravagance. I call it the X factor. She was extreme, extreme, extravagant. She was taking it too far. But maybe she had a different appraisal and appreciation. Maybe we're not crazy to give to God. Maybe there is something that happens when we give. Maybe there. Maybe there's an X factor. And I was thinking about the example. The example. Write these three things down if you would, because I, I really want you to be in a state of gratefulness, appreciation, and anticipation as we give today. And even if you're not giving, think about the example. You know, we've been talking a lot in this series about full circle moments and how you don't really see the circle. While you're, while you're still in it. And the disciples can be forgiven, if you ask me, for having a hard time making sense of this woman's sacrifice because, uh, well, the cross hadn't happened yet. I mean, think about it. We have the benefit of the knowledge of what Jesus was about to do. So we know if we choose to study that it would be just hours from now. That Jesus would be riding into the city of Jerusalem, Bethany's only a couple miles away, on a donkey in fulfillment of the prophecy, and the people would lay down their palms, branches, and say, Hosanna, Hosanna, knowing that their Hosannas were only a prelude to crucify him, because we see the full circle. We, we, we know that this was this woman's opportunity. We know that this was her window to do something significant. For the one whom she considered her savior, because we see all of that. The disciples didn't know it yet. In fact, it's significant that it happened during the Passover feast. 
And the Israelites would have understood this. We don't celebrate it the same way they did, but they had been brought out of slavery. They had been brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And when the plague came upon Egypt, God instructed the children of Israel to sacrifice a lamb, put the blood on the doorpost. When I see the sacrifice, I'll pass over your house. I will not visit you with their punishment. And if you've ever had God pass over a punishment that you deserve in your life, you understand something about the celebration of sacrifice. They were, they were having a dinner. They were having a celebration. But this woman had a sense of sacrifice. They're all reclined at the table. Peter just burped. Remember, you got to read the Bible with all of your senses. And here comes this woman. Here comes this woman. She's, she's only following the example of the one. See, what they, what they couldn't seem to see, what, what they couldn't seem to understand, what they couldn't seem to sense. Everybody say sense. Is that this whole thing was winding down. For three years, he's fed people. For three years, he's healed people. They've been there for that. But now this thing is winding down, and the hour is approaching for him to do the very thing he was born for. It was headed to a cross all along, but they couldn't see it. And at this moment, this woman knows not only is this the Passover season, but the Passover lamb is sitting at the table. See, Jesus was the lamb who was slain. Can I preach for a minute? Jesus was the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the earth. And what the blood on the doorpost signified was now sitting at the table, and they didn't even see it. But she did. And if he could come and die for me, the least I could do is break a vase for him. Come on. If, if he could stretch his arms wide enough to accept me, to welcome me, to restore me, I get happy when I preach the gospel because I realize that in the shadow of his sacrifice, it's a privilege for me to give to him. It's a privilege for me to praise him. It's a privilege for me. Makes sense. It couldn't make sense to the disciples. The cross hadn't happened yet, but now it has. What's your excuse? This is a little extreme, don't you think? A little extreme. That's what that little voice tells me. I'll write that check. This is a little much, don't you think? You could buy Holly real nice. You know, and then I think of the vehicle with this. Amen. I think all that stuff. I think all that stuff and uh, doesn't make sense. And it didn't make sense for the spotless Lamb of God to give his precious lifeblood for sinners like me. And you. You want to talk about what doesn't make sense? What doesn't make sense is that God would freely welcome us into his kingdom and freely give us all things. It doesn't make sense. We get too comfortable and complacent. We lean back at the table like we belong there. And then when the opportunity to sacrifice comes, we scoff at it. But if you really remember what God saved you from, and if you really appreciate what he is to you, somebody shout, it's no sacrifice. It makes sense. It makes sense for me to give to him everything I am. I am because of him. He's my example. I wish I knew more about this woman. That's one thing that bothers me about the Bible. It's not the Bible's fault, but in the time it was written, they didn't put a high value on women, so even her being in the room didn't make sense. And when you get women in the Bible, sometimes you don't even get their name. Same thing with a lot of poor people. that You wouldn't know their name. You would just know their condition. 
I wish I knew who this woman was, because I think if I could know who she was, I think if I could understand more about her story, I could understand more about her sacrifice. I mean, there must be more to her story. She didn't wake up that morning and decide to break a vase, pour a year's wages on the master's head. Something must have happened in her life to bring her to this point. I wish I knew what it was. Mark doesn't tell me who she was. Wait a minute. Hang on. Give me a second. Okay. That's right. John tells the same story in his gospel, chapter 12. Y'all got a minute? Y'all got a minute? We're going to give in a minute, but John, John tells the same story. It says in my Bible, it has a cross reference. It says that John tells his story in chapter 12. Okay, all right, all right, chapter 12, verse 1 of John's gospel. Um, let's see if we, can, if we can understand her experience. That's the second X factor, her experience. Uh, I want to understand her experience so I can understand her extravagance. I want to make sense of her sacrifice, so I need to know her story. What would bring her to this point where she would want to give a year's wages? Uh, okay, let's see what John has to say. Maybe he'll help us out. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where oh, this is getting good now, where Lazarus lived. I remember Lazarus. He was dead. In chapter 11, he was dead. Now he's living. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. It's chapter 12. Uh, usually, <laughs> usually you don't see that kind of stuff. Usually you don't see that kind of stuff where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. I don't have time to preach about Lazarus. Wish I did. Wish I had time to tell you about how Jesus didn't come when they wanted him, but he showed up on time. Sometimes he'll be late on your schedule so that he can reveal something about his character to you that you couldn't have known. If he had come when you requested him, he couldn't have revealed to you what you needed to know that you didn't know that you needed to know. Sometimes he will leave you in a situation a little bit longer than you want to stay there. And uh, well, Hold on now. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served. I remember her. She's the one who cooked for Jesus. That's why Jesus liked to come through Bethany. So Martha, remember now, this is the same story Mark is telling. In chapter 14, John has just given us a little different vantage point, a little different detail. So we know it's at Simon the leper's home, but this family is there with this guy named Lazarus who Jesus loved, who was dead, and now he's alive. And that's such a miracle that they wanted to do something to honor what Jesus had done for them. So they get Simon the leper. Leper's home, because Simon, you used to be a leper, and then Jesus touched you, and now you're cleansed. So you open your home, and I'll cook the meal. Watch this. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary. Oh, now I got it. This woman wasn't just any woman. Then Mary, the one who saw her brother get up from the grave. Then Mary, the one who knelt down at his feet and said, if you had been here, Lord, my brother wouldn't have died. The one who took him to the place and watched as his word. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I'm excited because I've been there before. I've seen dead things come to life. I've seen one word from God transform a situation. Then Mary. It makes more sense because it was Mary. It makes more sense because she had a personal experience of the power of God. When I give today, you need to understand that I'm giving from experience. God has been there for me. There were times I thought I wouldn't make it. There were times where I prayed and I didn't even know if he heard me. But with one word, 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 with one word. With one word. He called me out of my grave. You don't mind being extravagant when you've had a personal experience with God. And I'm not going to experience the celebration 
and resist the sacrifice. You can sit at the table if you want to. But after what God has done for me, He is the resurrection, He is the life. So even when I give it, it's not gone. You didn't hear me. The example, the experience, the expectation. It's the X factor. When a farmer plants a seed, he doesn't have a funeral for it. Why? He's going to see it again, and it's going to be greater. So I give with expectation. And I think if we could ask Mary, somebody say there's something about Mary. And some X factor, some expectation. She didn't know we'd be preaching about her 2,000 years later. Come on, But somehow she sensed that this was it. She had the ability to hear from God. And with all five senses, she worshiped him. She she filled the room with an aroma. She was willing to be seen. She heard the instruction. She heard that this was her moment. She wiped his feet with her hair. And everybody at the table had tasted his goodness. But she made a decision to make a sacrifice. And I wonder today, have you ever broken a vase for God? Many of us have never even made a sacrificial gift. And we don't do it because we're scared. If I really believe in resurrection, if I really believe that what goes in the ground doesn't stay in the ground when it is planted in the soil of faith, if I really believe that what Mary did is still being told, if I really believe that nothing that I keep can be kept and nothing that I give can be taken away, if I really believe that it's more blessed to give than receive, if I've really had an experience, it's different when they're yours. Now I get why you would change a kid's diapers. Because I got one that, that I like. I got three that I like. What are you talking about? I like all of them equally, especially Elijah. He's in the worship experience. It's priceless for me. You think I regret anything I've ever given to this church? We were talking about it before we came over that he gave $70 when we were giving to build the Banner Years building. Now, don't tell him that was my money anyway. He thought it was a sacrifice. All right? But it was, it was his expression of faith that some money that he had had from his birthday. And now he's sitting in the sacrifice. They were sitting with their sacrifice. And one woman sensed that this is the moment. And when you hear the voice of God speak to you, you have a choice. Have faith or make sense. Have faith that if I break this vase, and the one that I'm breaking it for is resurrection. He doesn't do resurrection. He is resurrection. If I if I put this perfume on myself, it will fade, but if I put it on him, it will not be taken away. And we still smell. I think if we could ask Mary, she would say, Thank you very much for your sermon, Pastor Stephen. It was very nice, but it wasn't a sacrifice. What he did for me on the cross, that's sacrifice. It wasn't sacrifice. It was my opportunity. In just a moment, you have an opportunity. An opportunity to show appreciation. An opportunity to anticipate what he's about to do. And who knows what will happen when you give. Well, I definitely didn't want to close this broadcast without extending a special invitation to our online family. You know, this challenge is for you too. 
a lot of times when we're watching a sermon on video or listening on a podcast, we somehow think that the contribution factor doesn't apply to us. We just get in consume mode, consume, consume. Oh, that was good. And then we click off and we go about our business. Let me ask you a question. Could it be possible that God is calling you beyond just consumption and actually calling you to contribute? We believe in this ministry. We believe that we've only just begun to see what God can do through us. And I wanna invite all of you who watch online, there are tens of thousands of you and you consider yourself family at Elevation Church. Well, as our family here in our local locations would be giving this weekend, we would want you to have the same opportunity to give as well. And so if you wanna go online, of course, elevationchurch.org has all the info you need. You can find the giving tab and uh, make a gift, make a sacrifice see what God will do. We don't want you to just stand on the outside window shopping. We want you to be a part of what God is doing here. Participate, partner. One of my friends texted me last week after hearing me preach about giving and generosity. And he said, you know, it's not right. For years, I've been coming to this well, taken out, and I've never put anything back in. No more, he said, I'm gonna get it right and uh, he made a decision to make a sacrificial gift. So whether you give a one-time gift or set up recurring giving at elevationchurch.org, we would love to include you in your giving as a part of our Beyond campaign for future expansion, physical and digital at Elevation Church. Would you pray about it? In fact, maybe don't even just pray about it. Sometimes we use that as an excuse. Sometimes we use that as procrastination in the form of prayer to keep us from doing what we know God is calling us to do. Would you dig deep? and give a gift today. Whether or not you ever do, we consider it an honor to minister to you, but we would love for you to have a part, not just sitting on the front row, but actually take your place in the story. We believe that God wants to do something beyond what you could ask or imagine. We thank you in advance for your giving. God bless you as you give.